Hello, I'm Dr. Northwest, and this is a, a part two of the series of why I get sick. And this one is specifically on the COVID-19 virus. And I'm going to go over in more detail than I did in the last presentation as exactly how much we learned from this particular virus. And then as we proceed through the series near the end of it, we're going to be going over all of the treatments for uh, COVID. In fact, is um, the treatment for COVID is a robust immune system so you don't get it in the first place. So we're going to show you how during this series as to how to achieve a robust immune system. So let's get started on the second of a series, uh, why we get sick. And don't forget to thumbs up and uh, share this video so we can get this out to as many people as possible. And as a matter of fact, well, a few weeks ago, I actually had all the symptoms of COVID-19 for about a week. Uh, my muscles were weak and my skin uh, felt uh, uh, tingly. And if I put my fingers on my head like that, it would feel like a little pinpricks, uh, a diarrhea and just fatigue for about a week. And uh, my appetite went away. And so I think I pretty much had um, COVID-19, but I use completely herbal medicine uh, to number one, intercept it before it got going. And uh, just be patient because I'm going to show you the herbal medicines that I use. And one of them is the same one I use for many years when I get that little tickle in my throat and I think I'm going to get a virus. And so I take this verbal uh, medicine and it just knocks the the soreness or that tickle out of your throat and you don't get a cold or if you do, you get a very mild one that lasts a day or two. And then the other herbal medicine was four pills a day for uh, two weeks. And so my wife, who is Chinese, was able to procure that for me. And I think between the two, I had an extremely mild case. But be patient. I have to get through all this uh, preliminary material, and then when we get into treatment, I'll disclose all these medicines that I took. For you patients that have diabetes and heart disease and uh, suffer from overweight, then it's all the more important for you to listen to these videos and to be able to uh, boost your immune system because you have to, to build this up over time. And when it comes to the symptoms of COVID, you want to do the herbal medicine immediately. As soon as you get a scratchy throat, then the herbal medicine starts. And that way you can avoid be getting sick. But if, if you start to get sick and you don't intercept it, then make sure that you see your doctor and do what uh, we're going to go over the medicines that the physicians use when you actually are get serious. Because when it's serious, it requires sometimes hospitalization and medications that, that we're going to talk about in a few minutes uh, for you patients. So um, in our office, if you come in, um, I'm going to have a program that helps people, number one, lose weight and actually how to, to get healthy so that when these viruses come along, they're not going to hurt you. We know the COVID-19 has new strains now. So when you, you can take the vaccine, which I encourage you to do, but the thing is, we now know that that vaccine may not be so good for the, the strain that's uh, appeared in London or in England. So make sure that you get on this program and get healthy so that these viruses can't kill you. Uh, you can go back and review it. That I started publishing books in 2009 on the subject. Uh, the Scout Stealth Killer was the first one, and that basically introduced the relationship between gum disease and Alzheimer's disease and also uh, Lyme disease and syphilis. So all those are, are related to each other. And then the other book is Chronic Disease Unfairly Targets Women. And I think it's for all women should read that book. And then The Silent Saboteurs, my co-author David Krutchkoff and I collaborated on this book. And this gets into a lot more detail in the relationship between gum disease and systemic disease, and the legalized crime and plant dentistry turf wars and modern chronic disease talks about the legal problems with patients who um, 
suffer from chronic disease with multiple missing teeth and how that um, uh, patients with more and more missing teeth, which I call multiple tooth syndrome, seem to have immune suppression and also cognitive decline. I think that's a very good book for most dentists that are implant dentists to know what they're getting into. And then to stop Alzheimer's disease, it basically is a, a short uh, summary. So I just want to make sure you understand that um, purchasing these books, all of the proceeds go into further research on this subject. I've heard theories of the origin, you know, from the snake and the bat, and we've heard you know, by a weapon story and we've heard so many things that um, you know who's vulnerable who's not and so we're gonna it's not the purpose of this presentation to get into any of these theories or whatever but we want to know what the underlying conditions were that allowed people who got this virus to die preferentially over other people who didn't die early on we had reports from china that the virus actually didn't originate in the, the Wuhan seafood market because there were other cases right from the very beginning that were not related to that seafood market at all. So let's just analyze the COVID-19 virus and see what it does to the body and how it contributes to death. First of all, uh, the COVID-19 shares a high level of genetic similarity as a 96.3 with the VAT coronavirus, uh, particularly the RATG13 rat uh, virus. It's very interesting, this article, it's uh, written by Sayo. Um, RV is not, does not contribute to the 2019 COVID-19 genome. And this was published in the Emerging Microbes and Infections. I noticed once I got started in this study back in January and February that uh, going to Pep PubMed and, and looking and take, uh, searching out the articles on COVID-19, uh, or we didn't know it, that name by then, but this particular virus that there's a lot of publications uh, in peer-reviewed literature on these viruses and how they've altered the genetic code and uh, as to why they're doing it and developing ways of, of uh, adding different um, elements to the viruses to make them worse or make them better. And they all claim that they're doing this so they can understand it better, but of course, there's the conspiracy theories that they're doing it as bioweapons programs. And the thing is, again, I'm not here to condemn anybody for what they're doing in research, but I know that many of the virologists um, are friends with each other. They all go to the same meetings together, and they're all studying these kind of viruses for whatever their particular motivation might be. So in this particular art article, the researcher is writing in a peer-reviewed journal that HIV did not contribute to the 2019 COVID genome. It's interesting, it was written to um, prove that the, some of the information that's been spreading around the world that it's related to the HIV virus, the S protein is related to that. And this article is supposedly to debunk that theory, but I found this article very interesting in that um, I was able to understand the viral much better by the examples this particular author put into his article. And it helped me understand how this virus is. And, and then he gives a little clue at the end of the article as to how this thing might have been generated in the lab. So as we analyze this paper and how he relates the HIV is the glycoprotein 120. We hear a lot about the glycoprotein 120 and that this is a unique uh, protein on the COVID-19 virus. But in the HIV, we have four inserts. You know, this is the green, one in green, the one in red, the one in black and the one in purple, and you see how they relate to the COVID here, 
by uh, the author put the green, per, uh, blue, the magenta, and, and uh, red, showing that these uh, are the same on both the HIV and also the COVID-19 virus. And But in his article, if you read the article, which I read these articles, they say, well, it's similar, but it's not similar enough, but, you know, we, we don't think it's related, but it could be. And that's kind of how they uh, explain it away in this particular article. Now it's a little complicated, but when you look at the, the genome and you look at the, what we call the, the molecular biology rendition of this particular thing, we can see how this S protein uh, binds to what we call the ACE receptor on uh, the tissue in the lung. And the ACE receptors are actually found primarily in the lung, but also in the nose and the throat. But this particular protein is uh, related to the SARS and also um, uh, the, that ro the, the bat uh, virus. And this seems to be why this particular virus is so contagious and that this binding to this ACE protein is so efficient. And that's why they think that this particular virus is uh, causing so much trouble and it is so infective. So in his article by Seo, he was trying to explain how the HIV did not contribute to the COVID-19 genome. But I read the whole article and in his discussion, he said, but if, if it did, you would have to put the two viruses together, the bat virus and the HIV together in the mouse uh, culture, and they'd have to culture those two together in the same cells. And as a matter of fact, Mitchevich, um, in her discussion of the COVID virus, how it was done, admitted that that was exactly what happened. A lot of the research done on these particular viruses were published in very well accepted peer reviewed journals. And to get an idea why the Chinese were working on these particular viruses, there's a lot of research that or papers that show that they're working on this to find cures for coronaviruses. And so they were working with HIV cassettes to find if they could be placed in the uh, coronavirus and then they could target that with a vaccine, trying to find and understand the viruses and how to get better vaccines. And I think that was the primary motive of most Chinese re, uh, biologists. And in the middle of the pandemic, then comes a Chinese whistleblower uh, she's an MD, PhD, but highly credible, and she was very knowledgeable in this particular line of research. And she actually reported that the COVID had a, a fear and cleavage in what we call the, the coronavirus spike glycoprotein, the S uh, cassette on the protein that's not characteristic of nature. And you have to go and research out, listen to what she has to say, because she actually gets um, into more important issues, such as uh, the bioweapons program in China, and this possibly was a uh, bioweapon, but she really didn't commit to whether it was released by accident or whether it was uh, maliciously released. So she's very credible, and I think that if you really want to know the truth about things, you have to listen to all the voices. Wang and another Chinese biologist in his paper um, describe a smoking gun in the COVID-19 virus. And it was the same S protein that was discussed in the last slide. And they had a fear and cleavage RRAR within the S1, S2 spike glycoprotein. This um, actually increases the um, infectivity and transmission of the virus, and that is why it is so highly contagious. And this is not found in any of the other SARS-like coronaviruses, and it's definitely not uh, characteristic of natural viruses. Now that we 
learned a little bit about the virus and, and my question is, well, how in the world do they um, precisely add cassettes here and there in viruses? And so I started doing a little research and of course we've all heard the word CRISPR and this is how they actually edit DNA and CRISPR uh, stands for clustered regularly spaced short palindromic repeats and it was discovered uh, while they were studying what we call bacteriophages and their attacks on on cells and they studied the cells that survived uh, the attack by the virus and they found these tiny little um, patches of DNA and within the DNA they found these segments that matched the virus. And so as they studied this, they began to understand how this process works. And I'm going to try to explain it to you. It's hard to describe very complex things and make it simple. But when the viruses uh, were attacking bacteria, the bacteria was somehow able to read various portions on the viral DNA and, and would cut out these little segments in a protein called a Cas9 protein would pick up these little segments and they would go around and, and test the viruses. And when that section matched, the, the Cas protein would latch onto it and literally cut the virus and stop its replication. So here's a rendition of that Cas9 enzyme and they have a little tail out with the virus DNA code and when it finds an identical match it latches onto the the virus target DNA and actually cleaves the virus so that it, it disables it altogether. Every cell in our body contains a copy of our genome over 20,000 genes 3 billion letters of DNA DNA consists of two strands twisted into a double helix and held together by a simple pairing rule. A pairs with T and G pairs with C. Our genes shape who we are as individuals and as a species. Genes also have profound effects on health, and thanks to advances in DNA sequencing, researchers have identified thousands of genes that affect our risk of disease. To understand how genes work, researchers need ways to control them. Changing genes in living cells is not easy, but recently a new method has been developed that promises to dramatically improve our ability to edit the DNA of any species, including humans. The CRISPR method is based on a natural system used by bacteria to protect themselves from infection by viruses. When the bacterium detects the presence of virus DNA, it produces two types of short RNA, one of which contains a sequence that matches that of the invading virus. These two RNAs form a complex with a protein called Cas9. Cas9 is a nuclease, a type of enzyme that can cut DNA. When the matching sequence, known as a guide RNA, finds its target within the viral genome, the Cas9 cuts the target DNA, disabling the virus. Over the past few years, researchers studying the system realized that it could be engineered to cut not just viral DNA, but any DNA sequence at a precisely chosen location by changing the guide RNA to match the target. And this can be done not just in a test tube, but also within the nucleus of a living cell. Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAM. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut but the repair process is error prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. These mutations are random, but sometimes researchers need to be more precise, for example, by replacing a mutant gene with a healthy copy. 
This can be done by adding another piece of DNA that carries the desired sequence. Once the CRISPR system has made a cut, this DNA template can pair up with the cut ends, recombining and replacing the original sequence with the new version. All this can be done in cultured cells, including stem cells, that can give rise to many different cell types. It can also be done in a fertilized egg, allowing the creation of transgenic animals with targeted mutations. And unlike previous methods, CRISPR can be used to target many genes at once, a big advantage for studying complex human diseases that are caused not by a single mutation, but by many genes acting together. These methods are being improved rapidly and will have many applications in basic research, in drug development, in agriculture, and perhaps eventually for treating human patients with genetic disease. Now, understanding viruses, again, it's a very complex subject. And so you can understand that, you know, in my curiosity, I, I read everything I could and I stumbled across something that I think is very important because there's a lot of accidents that can occur in nature that form very virulent types of viruses. For example, we're talking about viruses. And there is actually research that shows that if accidents occur, whether they're created by man or whether they're created in nature, that nature doesn't like it. So there's a natural attenuating mechanism that can occur that starts to denature these accidents. And so what happens like for the SARS-2 or the COVID-19 viruses is that the things that were created in the lab will start to be knocked off when there would be genomic deletions. And this is a natural process for nature, or if you want to think of a higher a source there or, or whatever you want to think that kind of watches over what is uh, produced in nature. And when accidents occur, there's a natural occurring thing that actually starts uh, lopping off those accidents and bringing that virus back to a normal uh, uh, acting virus so that it doesn't cause as much death in the population as it could have. There's a very famous biologist from Russia, Gumatov, and his article written in a uh, Russian language backs up that notion that I just talked about, about nature denaturing uh, wild viruses. This notion that nature tries to disrupt or to denature rogue viruses is, is confirmed by a very famous French um, biologist, Mont Montanier, and confirmed by this professor, the Russian, Kamatov. And what they found is that they found that the sequencing in the coronavirus was part of the HIV or the AIDS virus. And they went on to say that nature tries to constantly get rid of vogue segments of this virus. So in the COVID-19, the parts that make it virulent get smaller and smaller as time goes on. And I think that we can, as we look back at the pandemic now, we can look at back at it for several months. And I think this is exactly what happened. The first uh, original parts of this virus were very, very virulent and killed a lot of people initially. And then as time went on, it became less and less virulent. And now today, uh, the whole president's staff, including himself, got it. And it was very, very mild. And most people that get it today, uh, for the most part, don't even know they, they have it. For example, I was with my daughter uh, just this last weekend and she got tested and found out that she was positive and she had a very mild cold several months ago. And so now I think that the virus is attenuated to the point where it's not a danger to most people and, and the public. So we shouldn't be afraid of it. There's a lot of controversy as to the testing for the COVID-19, almost right from the beginning. And just recently, a Professor Beatus Stradler, it's PhD, and he's Professor Emeritus and Swiss molecular biologist. 
He's a former director of the Institute of Immunology from University of Bern. And it's quite a character individual, but it shouldn't take away from his credibility. But he um, had showed some anomalies in the COVID-19 testing. First, he had pointed out the first commercially available antibiotic test for COVID-19 was an old antibody test that was meant to detect SARS-1. The immune system considers SARS-1 and SARS-CoV-2 at least partially the same. In a study they had done, 32% uh, of people in Berlin who had never been in contact with COVID-19 virus showed the same T-cell reaction to COVID-19 as to the common cold. So if we do a PCR corona test on an immune person, it is not a virus that is detected, but a small shattering part of the viral genome. In other words, when someone's immune, the immune system starts breaking down the virus into small parts. And a PCR test takes small pieces of DNA, which is uh, uh, targeting that particular genome, and it amplifies it millions of times so that you can actually do the test. So when you're doing PCR, it's, it's detecting fragments, not necessarily the whole genome. So it's likely that the most daily reported infection number are purely due to virus debris. In this whole time in studying and trying to understand you know, COVID-19, we've come across some very unusual medications that seem to be working. And there's been a lot of controversy as to why they would work against the virus, because typically like antibiotics don't work against viruses. But if you understand the people who seem to be dying from COVID-19, particularly overweight or obese patients with diabetes, but they have what's called, these are chronic inflammatory diseases, all of which have to do with immune suppression and the cognitive decline. And a lot of it has to do with the modulation part of the immune system and the fact that the immune system cannot detect whether a virus or whether it's mild or whether it's a really virulent one, so it attacks everything violently. So when we look at the medication use, and particularly the steroid, why would it work? Well, what it's doing is calming down the immune system from its violent attack to a less violent attack, because probably the overreaction of the immune system is the most dangerous part of this virus, and it destroys the lung tissue. And vitamin D, for example, they give that because vitamin D in all these patients is, is lowered. And we're going to discuss this as this slide presentation continues, that this whole vitamin D mechanism, we now know that vitamin D itself, the vitamin D25, is low. But the active form of the vitamin D is 1, 25, which is high. And we're going to discuss why that's important. So... Two of these medications give us a lot of indication is that these chronic inflammatory diseases cause immune suppression that allow the virus to kill the patient. Continue on with discussion of medications and why they work with um, COVID-19. Hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine reduces a parasitic load. Antibiotics reduces a bacterial load. Well, what is it about chronic disease that these microbes are there in the first place? Again, what we just discussed is chronic disease patients have a depressed immune system. So they have imbalances in bacteria already. That's part of their microflora is that their, their immune systems are oppressed and bacteria and parasites proliferate and become uh, overactive. So that's why the, the antiparasitics work and why the antibiotics work because they actually go in and reduce the load on the patient so that they can fight the virus. And the vitamin D mechanism, which we're going to again discuss in more detail, is the key element. And, and testing for vitamin D gives you a clue as to whether the patient is suffering from immune suppression. True, in the next presentation, uh, we're going to go over the viruses, and as we move through the series, uh, near the end, I'm going to go over all the things that you need to do, including herbal medicine that some of you have been uh, uh, inquiring about. And in my opinion, some of the ancient medicines of China 
and India um, are probably the most effective and they've been used for thousands of years and we're going to cover that but be patient until the end or if you want go purchase the virus killer book and uh, that's disclosed in that book as well. This concludes the lecture on the COVID-19 and I hope you understand it better and understand how important this information was in our understanding of chronic disease and why people succumb to this virus. And also um, it's similar to the regular viruses that we get every year. Many people die of that. So it's very important that you stay healthy and have a tip-top immune system to be able to avoid these viruses.